All right. I believe we are live. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm Nicole. If you're new here, I'm former fat girl and I'm joined by a new friend of mine, Amanda of your wellness ally. And uh, she is a physician assistant. So we're going to be talking all things proper human diet, uh, what it's like to work in the healthcare setting, practicing the proper human diet and answering your questions. So, uh, for those of you who will be trickling in, uh, we are live, so feel free to drop your questions in the chat box and uh, put a cue in front of it to flag it for us, and we will be sure to get to you. But thank you so much, Amanda, for, for joining us on this Sunday morning or afternoon. Ooh. Right. Thank you so much, Nicole. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So let's get started before we get into the fun stuff. Um, I am... OMAD now, kind of. Today I'm too mad, so it kind of rotates, but I've, I'm noticing I'm OMAD more and more recently, which is very interesting to me and so much easier when it comes to planning food and work and stuff. Um, so let's start off with some a fun question to kind of break the ice as people start trickling in. What Did, did you eat uh, a meal yet today? If so, what, what was your first meal? Um, and you're talking to me, right, Nicole? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, first of all, should I just tell people who I am or like a little bit about myself? Or are we just like going into the question? Oh, no, this was just my question to kind of break the ice to give people a chance to come oh, into the okay, okay, okay. Okay. About your back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am a two meal a day girl. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, an extremely active person. Um, so I used to be someone who got up every morning and was starving. Um, but since adopting the carnivore lifestyle, I usually... I usually eat probably around 11 a.m. Um, and that's after my workout. Um, and I, you know, I eat a, a very large amount and then um, usually around five in the evening. So that's for me. It works really well. I still can't even believe it. Um, I used to try to fast. Right. And I couldn't do it because I was so hungry all the time. So it's it's a game changer. And I think also you know, adding in a little bit more fat than I was accustomed previously has been extremely helpful. Yeah, same, same here. Um, so we got Jerome in the house. What's up, Jerome? Thanks for, thanks for joining us. All right. So Amanda, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about who you are, your background, and essentially your journey to carnivore slash low carb? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you again. I just love connecting with like-minded people. Your energy is absolutely contagious. Um, the two of us, I love our dynamics. So thank you for that. Um, guys, my name is Amanda Brooks. Um, I'm a practicing physician assistant. Uh, way back when, because uh, I've been practicing for 20 years, when I was in college, I was actually studying um, English and French. I was studying abroad in Paris and a good friend of mine he fell very ill with an autoimmune disease. And I'm that helper, that empath, that person that wants to help someone. And so I was like, oh gosh, like what am I gonna do with an English major? So I went back to the States, came home, changed my major, earned a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition, love food, always have. Um, and I was thinking, again, it's going to be very difficult to practice as a registered dietitian and change the way in which people eat because it's just how we grow up. And I'm thinking, I want to be able to enter the world, make the biggest impact and provide the most value. So instead of going on to become a registered dietitian, I went on to physician assistant school. And so I, I graduated 20 years ago. And since then I have been practicing emergency medicine. Um, and, you know, I absolutely love it. The first probably seven years of my practice, I was strictly adhering to, you know, the medical model. In other words, um, here, if you have hypertension, here's an antihypertensive. If you come in, you know, with, you know, so basically just relying on big pharma. And it wasn't really until I was uh, in a big, like 60 bed ER in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I was thinking to myself, like one day, gosh, I am seeing so many sick people. Big pharma, like this doesn't, something just doesn't gel. And that's when I really started looking at alternative health. Um, and so I've been a huge advocate for kind of bridging that gap between modern and alternative medicine um, for, you know, the last 13 years or so. I've owned a wellness center. Um, I see patients in consultation online now. I'm still a full-time PA in uh, a smaller um, emergency department here in Bangor, Maine. Um, so that's a little bit about myself, um, which, um, yeah, so that's me. 
Awesome. And, and I'm so glad. And I'm sure hindsight is 2020. I'm sure you're glad you didn't go the RD route at this point. <laughs> I am. Oh my gosh. That's, I mean, just kind of a nightmare. It's difficult, you know, as you guys are getting on here, I mean, we're all big into our diets, um, but many people aren't, and they're not willing to make, you know, sacrifice because they, they do want that potion, that pill, that injection, that IV. Um, but yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah. I, I do want to give one person a shout out in the chat um, before we continue. So Carnivore Ron, what's up, man? So Ron is the one who actually um, recommended that you and I talk. Uh, so Ron has been absolutely amazing in uh, pointing me in, in directions of, of people's channels. So I'm very, very appreciative, Ron. You, you rock. He's a rock star. Well, hi, Ron. Thank you. I'm very glad that Nicole and I are in touch now. So thanks. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, what after all of your training, you're trained in nutrition, you, you have a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition, I'm sure it was largely plant-based, where like plant-based and uh, the RDAs and, and all that stuff, is that largely what, what you were taught in your nutrition education? Mm -hmm. Well, so it's kind of crazy, right? Like we adhere to the food guide pyramid, which, you know, if you aren't familiar, um, that's a crazy story that we can talk about if we have time. But no, actually, I was an athlete. Um, so big into weightlifting, you know, truly believe that muscle is the organ of longevity. So I was a huge advocate for eating meat. Okay. This is so crazy. Um, and then, like I said, I was, uh, practicing down in Pennsylvania. My then husband was in his orthopedic residency to become an orthopedic surgeon. And my mom, she was like, oh gosh, you got to read this. You got to read this. And so I ended up reading the China study. Um, and this was after throwing it away because she sent it to me. I threw all this plant-based stuff away. And then one day I just read the book and I was like, oh gosh, like that totally makes sense. Didn't check the references, didn't really do any research. And then just all of a sudden threw out all my meat and became a plant-based um, human. And I was plant-based for several years and I thought I felt great. But this is the thing. When people say that they're plant-based when they're vegan, they get rid of the crap, right? Like they get rid of the sugar. They're adhering to a more whole food diet. They're getting rid of the alcohol, the packaged goods. And so could I definitively say that it was the meat, getting rid of the meat that made me feel better? I really couldn't. So after several years uh, adhering to plant-based, um, I started having cravings for steak. It was so weird. Um, and so I was with a friend in Newport, Rhode Island. It was her 50th birthday. And we ended up going out for steak. And it was like a hush hush. You know, my family, they're vegetarian. And so I kind of felt like guilty about it, um, but then started sneaking more meat in, um, building more muscle in the gym, you know, felt like I could build the muscle. Um, but where I turned or found carnivore was crazy enough, online dating, met this guy. Thank you, Ryan. Um, he is a gym rat um, and he was talking about the carnivore diet. And instantly, guys, if you're plant based out there and watching this, like I get it. As soon as he told me he's carnivore and then explained to me that he only eats animal products, I'm like, woohoo, this guy is absolutely nuts. Um, deleted him, like, like, bye bye, like, we're not going to even meet on a date. But the information was there, right? The seed was planted. Um, and so I continued to live my life, essentially plant based, seeing super sick people in the emergency department, dealing with autoimmune diseases with my online business, not knowing how to help people making a few tweaks. Again, I have, you know, so much alternative medicine um, knowledge. I even trained at the Gerson Institute. I don't know if I told you that. Oh, no. to treat, yeah, to treat cancer naturally. So just like, I've just always been into finding what's best to help people. So anyways, four months ago, I just started thinking, what is this carnivore diet? I mean, I'm an open person. I'm going to read everything I possibly can. And, you know, thanks, Dr. Ken Berry, you know, Anthony Chaffee, um, Sean Baker, started reading all of the books and then started looking back at the China study and cross-referencing and like all of this. And like my mind was blown and I started just getting all these, oh gosh, click, 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 aha moments. I'm guessing you can kind of relate, Nicole, like just yeah. aha. And then I was like, I'm going to commit to, you know, 30 days, which then went to 60, which then went to 90. Uh, Cause I was like, I gotta, if I'm going to even recommend this to anyone, I gotta do it myself. I'm like, I'm not going to tell anyone because this is weird. Like this is, I'm, I'm probably going to feel like crap. Like that's what I was thinking. I can't even imagine getting rid of plants, but here I am never felt better. Can't keep quiet. 
And yeah, so super excited. And uh, it's all making sense. And, you know, with my background, it's just, oh, it's mind blowing. Yeah, I have so many follow on questions. So I did a reaction video. I'm not sure if you saw it with uh, someone who uh, critiqued the keto diet for the treatment of cancer and promoted uh, a plant based diet, of course, um, you know, because plants is what you treat for cardiovascular disease, uh, autoimmune, uh, cancer, all that stuff. It's just the, the gold standard. Um, so when you went and learned about cancer treatment, were they, did you learn about uh, cancer cells feeding on glucose? Like, I, I'm very curious on what you learned about the cancer aspect and nutrition. Yeah. I mean, on yeah, essentially um, with Gerson, I mean, Max Gerson, who is the founder, like he did an exclusion diet though, right? Like he had headaches, he got rid of everything. He started adhering to more like an apple, like a more plant rich based diet. Um, but they actually, interestingly with Gerson, um, there is a specific diet, but it actually focused more on manipulating thyroid, um, increasing antioxidant enzymes through coffee enemas and things like that. So there wasn't a huge emphasis on, on plants. But what's interesting about plants, since we know that plants are alive um, and they don't have defense mechanisms like, you know, fists and, you know, whatever to, to fight off predators. And so we know that they do um, create chemicals to keep themselves alive. And I'm a huge advocate. Um, uh, uh, I'm an essential oil like uh, enthusiast, uh, which, you know, in essential oils come from plant parts, stems, roots, whatever. And we use them medicinally to treat illness. So, again, when I was thinking about when Dr. Chaffee was saying plants are killing us, I was like, is he nuts? Um, but then I was like, wait a minute, like I'm using essential oils, which are highly um, effective against ailments as well as many herbs. Um, but I'm like eating all of this. I'm like, wait a minute, like cows eat grass. Like they just eat grass. Like wait, koalas, pandas, like they have, they've evolved, they've adapted to, to, to be able to tolerate a plant. But we as humans, we eat anything and everything. And specifically, um, like I said, I have a lot of patients with autoimmune disorders, um, weird rashes, like, and you know, our skin's our secondary chimney, right? So it's manifesting things that are going on internally. And so I've found now when we eliminate all plants, guess what happens? The rashes go away, you know, the, the, the symptoms dissipate. So I just found that really interesting. So if people are thinking, um, about plants and, and wondering why we're promoting not eating them and thinking it's insane. I get it. But I'm hoping, Nicole, that through people like us that we can we can educate and we can provide them with the information that a lot of us have now seen um, because it's going to it's going to make their health so much better. I know it's it, it seems like such a, a mind F, you know what I mean? Like I mean a total I mean it's 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 crazy for yeah. For do see the questions in the chat? I have started them. I, I promise I we will get to them in, in a minute. Um, so you mentioned cows, and and that's funny the timing of this conversation because I actually had someone in uh, my comment section of one of my most recent videos, and I appreciate every sub and every comment. Um, but he did make that comment about um, we humans do get our vitamins and minerals and nutrients from plants. And then he did make the reference to cows, cows. He's like, just look at cows. They eat grass all day long. And I'm like, yes, but they also have orch stomach chambers, one fermentation, one, you know, to handle all that stuff. We don't have that. Our digestive system is completely different. Uh, we're not made to digest that stuff or absorb that stuff. That's why it gets excreted in our stool or in our gas. And that's why it's very inflammatory. But he did compare us to to cows, and he did make that comparison that I thought was very interesting. I've never heard of anyone make that comparison before. Um, so just the timing of you mentioning that was kind of funny because I just read that comment this morning being compared yeah. to cows. Oh, that's so interesting. And just like while we're like on the animal thing, guys, like, do you have a dog or a cat? Because I'm gonna, I have a cat. I mean, I work twelve hour shifts, so unfortunately, I can't have the dog. Um, but Mr. Milo, he's like the $5,000 cat because, you know, cats and dogs um, are obligate carnivores. Um, but what we're doing to our domesticated animals is we're feeding them grains. 
um, and they're they're getting sick. So they're getting like Western diseases. So like I'm sure that you know someone's pet that has diabetes or you know heart disease. Well, my cat. Um, he kept getting urinary obstructions, and now he has a um, urethrostomy um, because of the crystals that were clogging up his um, urethra. Um, and so we're trying to transition my cat even to a carnivore diet um, because the, the kibble in the grains, um, they're actually, again, making animals sicker. I sometimes like to appeal to people through the animal analogy, Nicole, because uh, you're either... I mean, because there's so many animal lovers and people will do anything for their animals. So this is very eye opening as well. I mean, life expectancy of animals is getting so much shorter compared to to what it used to be because of what we're feeding them. Yeah. Don't eat your pets, people. So, <laughs> but yeah, we we um we just lost our, our senior kitty. I actually got a tattoo of his paws on my on my arm. Like it was very like the hardest thing we've ever had to do was put mm -hmm. our, our cat down. Um, We just lost him like two months ago. So it's still a little raw, but he yeah he had crystals a few years ago and he almost died then because we were away on vacation and then we came back it was uh thanksgiving weekend and uh we were visiting my husband's family in massachusetts and we came back and he just was collapsed and it was the crystals in the in the kibble we were feeding him and now we had to put him down because he had multiple myeloma so he had uh advanced um cancer so we actually had that thought as well we have one kitty one surviving kitty and we were thinking about we were talking about transitioning her she's 10 so i don't know how well it'll go but transitioning her to raw meat and their their natural diet so mm -hmm. i would definitely love to chat with you offline about sure. uh, your plans on doing that because we're thinking of doing the same the same thing yeah, sure. um and then the last thing is and then we'll get to the questions is you don't see a cave painting um, with green smoothies or um, people with their nose to the grass just eating grass uh, in their lawn. You don't see that in cave paintings. You see you see hunters killing uh, large ruminant animals and feasting on meat. You don't see them blending up green smoothies <laughs> and stuff like that on on cave paintings. So I just I just want people to to think a little bit about about that. <laughs> No, you know, but I think it's, it's also, um, it's part of the narrative, right? Like, and for me personally, just being uh, in modern medicine, like I kind of tend to go against the narrative because I feel like the narrative wants to keep us ill. Um, and so there's a huge push for um, plant-based um, right now. Um, and like you said, it doesn't make any sense when you think about it logistically. Like we really need to you know, we need to feed ourselves. Um, we need to make sure that we're not deficient in nutrients. And when I was plant-based, I had to supplement like up the wazoo, um, which was insane. And I kept like racking my brain on my jeepers. I'm like, geez, if this was the way to be like, where am I supposed to get B12? You know, why am I so deficient in, you know, um, K2 and D3 and vitamin A? Um, and so that's also food for thought because as we're sitting here, Nicole, and we're like talking about this way of life, this way to improve our health, you and I aren't pushing a product. Like, that's just it. Like, we're not like trying to sell anyone anything. We're literally just saying, guys, let's just go back to an ancestral diet. Let's like, think about this logically. If we think about the way in which the human body works and has evolved um, and what we need to function and how we're fatter now um, than we ever were before and sicker, um, something has to change. So I'm super appreciative of people like you, people in the chat, um, that are, you know, sharing this information and speaking out because guys, it's a hundred percent uncomfortable sometimes, but you know, it's uncomfortable, but we've got to be okay with getting uncomfortable. I promised myself that I was not going to talk about carnivore diet in the ER. Guess who's writing up discharge papers talking about the carnivore diet, this girl, everyone's like, what is this? So now it's, it's created, you know, all sorts of curiosity. Like when I have like a friend, you know, delivering a 20 ounce ribeye and everyone's like walking by, like it's an attraction, like what's Amanda eating? Cause they used, used to be a big salad and now it's like a big yummy smelling ribeye. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's creating curiosity. It's having people look at us and say, she's so fit. She's, She's so fit and look at her. She's not gaining weight. She's like lean as can be. And that's the other thing that I saw when I looked at Chaffee and Baker and Barry, like they all look like 
beautiful, muscular, fit beings. I used to be a huge advocate, and no disrespect, Dr. Greger, but I, I used to be a huge advocate for uh, certain plant-based positions. And if you compare the two body habituses, hmm, I mean, I mean, which would you rather be? You know what I mean? Like it speaks volumes. Just saying. That's funny. I do want to get into your to your practice. Well, let's uh, hit up some of some of these questions. Um, Let's welcome a couple people first. What's going on, Rick? Another vegan friend fell down the stairs and broke her arm. Yeah, um, Dr. Sean Baker actually did a video, I believe, yesterday about some vegan, um, a, a few vegan uh, TV stars or movie stars who fell and broke their bones. And he gave a stat on the likelihood of vegans breaking their bones, vice uh, animal eaters breaking their bones. Now, I'm not against people eating you know, fruits and veggies and all that stuff, if you can tolerate it, as long as you're meat dominant, as long as you're eating your meat is, is the key. Um, Carnivore Ron, Ron said the same thing. Several women in his gym are vegan. They don't talk to me now. I mean, I was vegan for four years and I gained 20 more pounds. No. Hey Ron, and don't worry, like they might come back around. Like I said, I talked to this guy, Ryan, a year ago and now we're still buddies. Like now we are like talking about carnivore all the time. So you're planting seeds. So, you know, yeah. There, there's probably jealous because <laughs> you're 70 something years old and you could probably outlift them. Yeah. Um, Roger, I've never seen a human out grazing on grass. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm mm -hmm. saying, unless you go out to your front lawn and put your snout to the grass and just start eating it. Yeah, but, this, but this is also the thing, right? Like as a plant-based advocate before, I was always hungry. And it's because the food that you're eating um, essentially is very high in fiber. And so you're pooping it out, right? So you're not, you're not absorbing all of the nutrients. That's what the, the main reason why I personally wanted to do carnivores because I was still a sugar addict. So I was like always hungry. Like my brain was always busy. I over exercised to compensate for any kind of sugar binge I might have. And I was just thinking, geez, I'm 44 years old. I just lack, uh, I, I just don't have any willpower anymore, but it's infinitely more than that. If your body isn't absorbing, if, if, if the foods that you're not eating uh, if the foods that you are eating, excuse me, are not, the nutrients aren't bioavailable, you're going to constant have constantly have cravings. So that's the biggest thing that I personally noticed uh, when I started uh, adhering to a carnivore diet is the chatter up here was completely gone. And so I have, you know, several followers online that are always like, they have huge addiction potential, right? Because sugar, we know can be compared to heroin. You know, I'm still seeing tons of meth addicts. I mean, uh, cocaine, it lights up the amygdala. So the part of the brain that's just like, ah, I need more. Um, and you know what though? It's socially acceptable. So when I go into the emergency department, there's little smorgasbords of sugar here and there. And people say that they can't get through their shift without it. Well, I tell you what, that was the first thing that I noticed on the carnivore diet is that, oh my gosh, I'm eating all of this red meat. My body feels satiated. I'm not having to like you said, Nicole, I'm not having to portion control. You know, no no animal out in the wilderness has to portion control. They eat until they're comfortably full and then they don't eat again until they're hungry again. And so I think that that's been, you know, there's a dichotomy, right? Like everyone wants to count macros and, you know, but Amanda, how much, like, can I eat? Listen, you eat until you're comfortably full. You're totally revamping the way in which the body works because you're actually learning to listen to your hunger mechanism, which none of us do. So I think that that's extremely powerful um, for um, for people and for for those of us adhering to this as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. So Dan or Don, sorry, um, what's going on? How often should a person fast, and does fasting raise your cortisol? So interesting question. Huge advocate for fasting, uh, and I think uh, Nicole and I were chatting before this, um, and so I think. Uh, I don't remember if I said this before or not, but I used to always try to uh, intermittently fast because when we're in a fasting state, um, we turn on that sirtuin gene, which is in charge of autophagy. So autophagy is basically like cleaning up cellular debris. Um, but I couldn't do it because I was always hungry. Whereas now, like Nicole, she usually eats one meal a day. I'm usually a two meal a day woman. Dawn, I don't recommend um, that anyone try to fast. I think you just need to listen to your body. So I'm different from you, Nicole, who's different from you. So what I would do, um, without further information is 
eat until you're comfortably full. And then I always say I have an, I have an uh, almost nine year old daughter. And if she's saying that she's hungry and she wants a snack, I say, do you feel like eating beef? She's like, no. I'm like, do you feel like eating eggs? She's like, no. I'm like, do you want me to, um, you know, so we go through those things. So if you're asking yourself these things, it's just out of boredom or emotional eating. Um, and so anyways, I would, I would look at that. Um, and then I would kind of go from there because people that have restricted for many, many, many years, they still need the three meal a day um, to adhere to this. All I care about is that you're not eating the trash. You throw out the packaged stuff, all the sugar, the preservatives, like all of that stuff. And then, um, um, you know, uh, then you'll find your, um, your little niche. And as for cortisol, you know, cortisol is a stress. Um, it's a, it's a response to stress. So, um, I don't know specifically the data between fasting and cortisol, but I would doubt that because when your body is, you know, you know, the fasting state is really our primary metabolic state. And that's the way that's the state in which most animals are in all the time. Their cortisol levels aren't raised. Okay. Um, and this is why I like Amanda because she said, don't eat like trash. I always say garbage. So <laughs> same thing. But yeah, um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to fasting, I, I agree. I don't know how long you've been doing carnivore, low carb or whatever version you're you're eating. Um, but you'll notice the longer you do it. I started out with three and then I went to two. And now I'm kind of like in between one and two some most days. Lately, I'm one. Some days, like today, I'm two. So it just depends on my my hunger and how much I ate the day before. But you'll notice that you naturally fast. One, you're naturally fasting when you're sleeping, unless you uh, sleepwalk to the fridge, which there are people who do that, nocturnal binge eating. Um, but unless you have that, then you're automatically fasting while you're sleeping. I don't recommend intentionally fasting. Um, you will notice that you naturally fast the longer you do this and your, your cravings will go away as far as your cortisol. Um, yeah, if you're, it, there's a number of things that raise your cortisol. If you fast intentionally and you're going extended periods of time without food, your blood sugar is going to naturally be low. Now you want to be careful with that because there's a point to where it becomes dangerously low. Um, but because of that, you have a slower release of cortisol. So your cortisol levels will naturally be low, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing either. So it just depends on what's affecting what. So if your blood sugar is low, say with someone like with diabetes, prediabetes or type two diabetes, say your blood sugar is low, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing unless it's low because you're eating the right types of foods. But if you're going prolonged periods and your blood sugar is low because you're not fueling your body, that's not necessarily a good thing. That's the same with cortisol. If your cortisol is super, super low, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a good thing because cortisol, it, it does affect other things in your body too. It's not a hundred percent negative a hundred percent of the time. Um, that's all I want to say about that. And then when it comes to emotional eating, since I know a lot of people struggle with this, um, just know the differences, uh, kind of like what Amanda said, if you're emotionally hungry, you're going to have sudden cravings, usually from boredom or eat your feelings type thing. You're going to have sudden cravings and you're going to be craving specific things, mostly salty, sugary foods. If you have true hunger, physical hunger, it's going to be a uh, gradual hunger happens over time and you crave a variety of foods, whether it's beef, butter, bacon, eggs, whatever. But if you are emotionally hungry or eating out of boredom, you're likely only going to crave a specific thing like I want a bag of chips, I want ice cream, or I want this, I want that. But over time, that will start to subside and, and decrease. At least in my case, that's what happened. You know what makes me like, um, if I do have that, like what I've created for myself that totally calms the mind is um, butter bites. I don't know if you guys have made oh, those. Yeah. yeah so you, I mean, you just basically take two sticks of butter, you stick it in a fry pan, you brown it, you put it in the fridge until it almost solidifies, take an immersion blender, you know, make it all fluffy, and then you put it into molds and you stick it in the freezer. Um, and then they're like little toffee candies. You literally can just like take a few of those out, pop them in, the salt kind of like quenches the the, the sugar craving, and then the uh, fat uh, causes the brain to relax and the craving to go away. So that's been very helpful for me. Yep, 100%. Uh, speaking of butter bites, uh, we do have more questions. But Jonathan, Carnivore Muscle, he just changed his channel name. He uh, he and his uh, partner make uh, butter bites uh, all the time. Um, but 
I do want to give him him a shout. He is he is a channel member. So if you want to if you want to join my low carb crew, uh, check out check out my channel. But uh, also check out Jonathan's channel. He does come up with a lot of great content, especially when it comes to muscle building, exercise, working out while doing the carnivore diet. Because there's a lot of misconceptions whether it comes to fats and carbs and all that stuff when you're trying to lean out or put on muscle. So definitely give his channel a, a check out. Yeah, I'm excited. Carnivore muscle. I don't want to scare you with my guns there, though. So um, well, we did yeah. ask. We're, we're going to have to show our guns. But Mark <laughs> says uh, essential oils, question mark. And then same with Ron. Why Why do essential oils, question mark? Can you So can you explain a little bit about um, the essential oils aspect? Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, um, like over the last, you know, 13 years, like I've just really been trying to bridge that gap. So pharmaceuticals, they typically treat... Um, you know, a symptom, um, and we're looking to uh, make the body function more optimally. Um, and so um, what I like about the carnivore diet is it does, it just naturally like reduces uh, fasting insulin levels, it's reducing inflammation. I think a lot of things can be completely cured by the carnivore diet. But before I found out about the carnivore diet, um, I had to have, I, I, I still need to have ways in which to effectively, you know, uh, effectively treat patients and their ailments by kind of giving the body what it needs. So like, for example, like um, young kids, right? Like they have sometimes a difficult time sleeping. Um, you know, their pineal gland might not be, you know, releasing uh, melatonin well or this, that or the other thing. And so I might use lavender. Again, you want something that's certified pure therapeutic grade because most essential oils, like you can kind of like, it's a fad now, right? So you can kind of buy them everywhere. Like, but the thing is, is since they're not third party tested, you could have like due to fairy, it's called fairy dusting. Um, you could have like one drop of an oil and it's like filled up with a seed oil for goodness sakes. I don't know. And so people are like wondering why they don't work, but essentially, like I said before, essential oils are, they're coming from plants and plant parts. Okay. And there's, you know, they're distilled down. Um, and so you need a very small amount. And I, I use them for a lot of different things for breathing, uh, for sleep, uh, frankincense, you know, we've studied this against cancer, like it stimulates apoptosis. So we know about it helping with, cell, you know, program cell death. I mean, there's so much, but that's a whole nother um, uh, little interview for, for, for me. Um, but it's interesting. Um, the reason why I've referenced essential oils is the fact that plants do create toxins to ward off predators, which is why it kind of clicked in my brain that, yeah, we're using these to treat ailments. We shouldn't be ingesting large amounts of plants. And I see this actually, there's a huge correlation between, um, interestingly, um, and again, I, I keep reverting back to the ER because that's where I work, but I'm seeing a huge amount of inflammatory bowel disease right now, whether it be diverticulitis, whether it be colitis, ulcerative colitis, bouts of Crohn's. Um, and like I said, I'm coming to you from Bangor, Maine. Guys, I live down the street from Stephen King, if you don't know where Bangor, Maine is. And um, everyone is eating out of their gardens right now. So I'm, I'm very careful to ask when I diagnose a patient with a, an inflammatory bowel condition, you know, what are you eating? The knee jerk is I'm eating a healthy diet. Well, what does that mean to you? And of course they spout off that they're eating all these fruits and vegetables and yada, yada, yada. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, every single person uh, with all of this like inflammatory bowel. And guess what I say, guys, I've got something. If I have something that I could tell you about that you could do that's non um, pharmaceutical to change the way in which your bowels are operating and so they're and make it so they're no longer sick, would you be open to hearing it? Guess what everyone says? Yes. Yeah. And what's interesting is if it's a female patient um, that has a husband accompanied uh, that's right there with her, and I'm saying, you know, eat beef, butter, bacon, eggs, the husband's eyes are getting so big and getting all excited. And so um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that dynamic, but again, it's, it's showing that increased amounts of fiber are causing microabrasions in the colon resulting in, uh, we know that high fiber diets are resulting in diverticulosis, right? Which is the outpouchings of the colon. And then they become inflamed to progress to diverticulitis, which requires antibiotic administration. But again, I'm randomly seeing inflammation to the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, which are, you know, the small bowel, as well as the large bowel. Um, and, and, and the big thing is, we need to decrease fiber consumption 100%. 100%. Same thing with like elderly people. Do you know how many times, please 
I, I hope that people do not come to the emergency department for constipation, if, if any of you guys are watching, but I see a lot of people in the department because they can't poop. And when I look at their med list, they're on Metamucil, I mean, up the wazoo, right? And they're like on all of these stool softeners. Uh, they're using fleets on them as they're doing all these things. And then when we sit down and think about it and we talk about how, you know, fiber is actually leading to constipation, which is, you know, dry stool that can't be evacuated from the colon. And instead, what we need to do is get rid of all that, increase fat consumption, um, and then you're not going to have an issue. So, um, again, it, it, it's it's an interesting dynamic. Um, and again, like I said, I, I wasn't going to talk about the carnival diet at work, but I can't even help myself. And it's just like being thrown in my face all the time now. So. Damn. Uh, well, that was good. All right, guys, that's all we have for you, Tam. I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, that was like perfect. Um, uh, Cause I work with seniors as well and, and their diet is God awful, but RDs come up with their, with their menus in hospitals, nursing homes, senior communities. And I look at the menu and there's one meat dish and the rest of it is soy and plant-based and carbs and sugary garbage. And it just like blows my mind. Um, and then the, the other thing about fiber is what most people don't realize is that you're not only losing vitamins and minerals. So say a nutrient, so say you eat a piece of steak with, with some green beans or uh, fruit or whatever. Yeah. It's going to get wrapped up. Those nutrients from the steak are going to get wrapped up and caked up in the fiber and you're going to excrete some of those nutrients out. So most people are aware of that, but what they don't know specifically when it comes to women, cause we're very hormonal um, and we have a lot of things going on every month. Um, pre and post menopause. Um, but what people fail to realize is yes, we may um, pump out extra estrogen at certain times of our cycle and month, whatever. But what happens is you're not only losing vitamins and minerals, you're also losing hormones. Your hormones are also getting wrapped up in that fibrous material and you're excreting some of that out too, which yes, excess anything may not be a good thing. So it may not be all bad, but losing anything uh, if, especially if you're eating a ton of fiber, which most people are and not realize it because they're eating so many fruits and vegetables and carbs and all that stuff, you're losing more than just vitamins and minerals and nutrients. You're actually losing your hormones are getting wrapped up in that as well. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that because I haven't really heard anyone talking about the hormonal aspect of it, but you are losing hormones as mm -hmm. well. And I believe that because of our diets, things like PCOS, endometriosis, um, uh, monthly visitor symptoms like menopausal symptoms, all those things. I think that's part of it is, is our hormones are, are getting even more affected because we're losing those hormones in the fiber as well as all the other things that are going on. So that's just what I think. I don't think the things women experience like the symptoms, the, the PMS symptoms, I personally don't think that's normal it's um, not. to feel that way. And I think, I think the hormonal aspect tied to the fiber aspect, I think plays a large role in that. That's just my hypo my working hypothesis, not backed by science people, but my working hypothesis, just understanding how fiber works when it comes to hormones and nutrients. That's just what I think. No. So I think that plays a part, but I think like the even bigger part, um, Nicole, is the fact that we as women, um, we're not consuming enough fat. So yes. since the 80s uh, with, you know, Susan Powder, who my mom was obsessed with and she got me obsessed with, you know, she always would say, you know, the fat that you eat is the fat that you wear. And so yeah. like, we're also obsessed with low fat. And that's why like, I just want to put another plug in before I forget, just because you have a physician or a provider that you know and trust, do not believe everything that they say blindly. Because as I'm sitting, you know, in the dictation room dictating, my colleagues are still saying adhere to a low fat um, da, 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 diet. And that's just not true. So with, with women and hormonal issues, jack up your, your fat mm -hmm. consumption because you can only absorb so much anyways. Um, and, and I've found that women that are perimenopausal, which I hate that term, but they're symptomatic. They're having like brain fog, um, fatigue, um, anxiety. Um, if we're increasing their fat consumption far above their protein consumption, they fare much better.
Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I didn't mention fat, fat because most people know fat regulates your hormones, but most people don't realize that you're losing hormones because yeah. they're wrapped up in the the fiber exactly. component. So if yeah, if you're increasing the fat and then decreasing the fiber, I mean it's a win-win. I don't have PMS symptoms anymore. Um, sometimes I might feel fatigued. Obviously, if I don't, because I sometimes don't think I eat enough fat. But um, other than that, I don't. I don't have. I don't have symptoms anymore. I, I don't have pains. I don't have discomfort. I'm not bloated because I'm not eating plant foods anymore and I jacked up my, my fiber. So that's a tip for any women listeners in, in this chat. Yeah. Hey, I see Lena's question. Like, oh my gosh, like I just have to. There's a bunch of questions. Which one? The, I, the one about uh, the premenstrual week cravings for bread, pasta, and ice cream. I just have to say one, one quick thing. Well, what I, time, time was it at so I can pop it up? Uh, it's like right under our pictures, like on my screen. I don't know. It says inspired art life. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. We were going to hit on that. I thought you were looking in the chat. Yeah. Oh, so. I don't even know what I'm looking. I'm a newbie. Nicole's like the ringleader. I don't even know what I'm doing here. So I popped it up on the screen. So oh, inspired by yeah. art, art life. Uh, Lena, what's going on, Lena? Uh, so carnivore for four months. Congratulations. The premenopausal, uh, the premenstrual week, the cravings for pasta, bright. Yep. All the, all the carbs. There's a reason for that. Um, I fell off the wagon every time. As women following the diet, maybe you have uh, advice. So, okay, okay, I'm, I'm not affiliated with uh, um, Cuisinart, but go get on Amazon and buy yourself a Cuisinart ice cream maker. Um, the best thing that I've ever done, um, I think his name is Dr. Kiltz, I saw, um, he creates carnivore ice cream. And all it is is a um, quart um, of uh, heavy cream and um, four egg yolks and some vanilla and he uses a pinch of salt. I'm not into the salt in my ice cream. Literally you whisk all that up together, you put it in the ice cream maker, it takes about 20 minutes. And then I just bought like little uh, cups from Amazon and I just um, put it in there. And so whenever I'm having that craving, Lena, like it's absolutely amazing. Um, you have, it tastes just like ice cream without the sweetness. So it's the same consistency. And obviously as you've been doing this for four months, I'm sure your taste buds are much more keen and astute to flavor. So cream actually tastes sweet, um, even though you never thought it did before, but it does now. So that's what I do. Um, so I always have that um, in my freezer for when I have a little, like a sweet attack. Yeah, uh, I'm actually getting a Ninja Cream uh, yeah. creamy thing. My husband's ordering it uh, from Amazon today. It takes one to two months to get that thing in and sold out in all the stores. It's really frustrating, but um, the, the ice cream is a good tip because I you, you better believe I'm getting that ninja creamy and I'm gonna make some protein ice cream too. But um, yeah, when you're when you're having the that time of the month, I mean your hormones. Most women know that their hormones are fluctuating, but what most don't equate to is also your blood sugar levels fluctuate as well because it's a stress to your body um, as well as your cortisol as well as your serotonin levels. So. If you have that time of the month and your blood sugar levels are affected, they do they do rise, um, may not be to the level of diabetics, but your blood sugar is affected every single month, unfortunately. Um, but when that happens, your body responds a certain way um, because your body thinks it's under attack. <laughs> so your body does to a certain extent, um, again, not as extreme as if you're under chronic stress or whatever, but to a certain extent, your body does respond the same way. Once your blood sugar is affected, once your adrenaline is released, you do have this release of your glycogen stores. And this is more so if you're still eating carbs, um, if you're eating, um, if you're a true fat burner and you truly transition, this may not affect you as much, but there, but there's a caveat to this. But if you aren't a fat burner yet, that is very common, those types of cravings because of the physiological response that your body's having every single month. The other thing is, is your serotonin levels are affected as well, which controls your mood. Um, amino acids that you get from meat, <laughs> such as tryptophan specifically, help uh, elevate your mood. Um, so that might help with the cravings and um, the the emotional eating. But that's really that's really what's happening. So that's very, very common. But the longer you do, uh, an animal-based diet, those cravings and your hormonal fluctuations and all that physiological response should be more balanced um, over time. But that's that's likely what's happening. So just ride it out 
and just know eventually it will it will normalize. Oh, you can do the protein ice cream, of course, but that's but that's what's going on and why a lot of people do a lot of women do crave the carby foods. It's because of that hormonal hormonal response. Let's see. We got Jerome. What's up, man? Uh, do you have any concerns that promoting something outside of the normal standard? Uh, yes, I wanted to get to this. Normal standard of care will pose a risk to your job. Okay, Amanda, go. <laughs> um, interesting. Um, so I've kind of always been that person that once I believe in something, I, I can't like not share it. You know, like that person that goes to the movies and sees the best movie and she tells everyone about the movie or, you know, a good dinner or whatnot. So, um, Jerome, like I got into medicine because I truly care about people. And I think a lot of my colleagues can't say the same. So I'm, I'm a huge advocate for um, personal choice um, and for informed consent. Um, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm providing them with information. What they choose to do with it is up to them. So I'm actually like starting to print things out on discharge papers because I'm hopeful that some of my colleagues, my cardiologist colleagues, my neurologists, like my internal medicine colleagues, my GI associates, like I'm hoping that we can have a round table discussion because like how cool would that be? Because my eyes were closed for so long, I just found out about this. And like I'm having all these aha moments because I'm looking into it. So I think a lot of them, you know, would be quick to shut the door on the information because they haven't looked at it, which is exactly what I did a year ago. So I'm hopeful that it's going to stimulate more of a conversation. Um, what I'm concerned about, I guess, is that um, those of you who have heard Dr. Sean Baker's story, you know, practicing orthopedic surgeon um, who was like creating prevention for a lot of his patients um, who weren't needing surgery after following his direction, um, but guess what? My ER, it's overrun with patients. We've got several hour waits and we don't have enough providers. So no, I'm not worried about losing my job. They couldn't get rid of me in function. So and in the meantime, I'm hoping um, that I'm just going to continue to help more people because that's that's genuinely what I want to do. Can you get your license uh, revoked or, or just, no? As, as a medical provider, right? Like you can get like five medical providers in the room, right? And like they look at things differently. So I might promote probiotics for this patient. My my colleague might not. Like they might. We, you, there's general st general standards of care, um, and then there's um, and then there's uh, personal preference and practice. Um, and so I'm not promoting anything lethal. I'm doing just the opposite, and I have all of the science to back that up. So if someone said, "Oh gosh, you're promoting red meat." that causes coronary artery disease, or that's gonna increase my cholesterol. And I'm thinking, uh, actually, it's the sugar that's doing that. And we can, we can show you specifically that three Harvard professors were paid off to falsify data to show that it wasn't sugar causing coronary artery disease, but instead it was red meat. So if we, if we wanna do that, hey, cool. Like I love having open, honest, like non-confrontational and non-argumentative conversation just about the facts. So that's, that's my answer. Yeah. Um, so this leads perfectly into this question. It's a little out of order, but you mentioned cholesterol. So uh, Gina, uh, welcome Gina from Facebook. Uh, what's going to happen to cholesterol eating a high fat diet? I get this question a lot. I'm definitely going to kick this over to Amanda because she's the doctor, but I have, I have two clients who were sent to me, um, of course, with high cholesterol, fatty liver, and one of them, actually two of them, um, had uh, um, heart disease. One, one had surgery, the mm -hmm. other has heart disease. And they were recommended by their doctor, the Ornish diet, the pl essentially a plant-based diet. Um, and I tried having a conversation with them just to give them another option, not to try to persuade them, but to give them another option. Um, and it's it's very hard to um, kind of explain to, to people or give them another alternative because doctors have a DR or MD at the end of their name. So they take their, they take their advice uh, to gold and they will, they will go to the grave with their doctor's advice. So I guess to add to this question about cholesterol, um, 
how do you recommend people in the nutrition space going against the grain or even people, you know, in a medical field going against the grain, um, explain this topic to patients who are prescribed uh, a plant-based diet for cholesterol and all these other things. So I guess that would be a second part of this question. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, if you haven't seen my video on cholesterol, like watch it, um, because it can go into far more detail than Nicole and I have time for today. Um, but again, it's, it's remembering that your provider went to medical school and was taught um, by professors to use pharmaceuticals. So we know that statins, which are um, cholesterol lowering medications, they decrease your LDL, your bad cholesterol. Um, and this is like one of the highest grossing um, pharmaceuticals in the nation right now. Um, that, that's a whole other story. But with that being said, in the medical community, I don't prescribe statins, I'm in the ER, but primary care providers, it's a knee jerk. You see someone's uh, cholesterol level, um, and, and you intuitively just stick them on a stat and it's just like a, it's a, it's a reflex, right? Like high cholesterol equals prescribe a statin. And like, I think a lot of times your provider doesn't even know exactly why they're providing it. They look at the research, um, but they're looking at, um, relative risk versus absolute risk. I mean, so there's a lot of things to unpack here, but in a nutshell, I will say this, what I will say is when we look at patients that have sustained MIs, uh, sustained um, heart attacks, um, we see a large portion of them that have low cholesterol. So if, 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 if low cholesterol was linked to lower risk of MI, why is that true? So when we're adhering to a carnivore diet, what we're doing is, is this. We're increasing typically our HDL, which is our good cholesterol, we're decreasing triglycerides, which triglycerides are a de direct representation as to what we're eating. Um, and our LDLs, they might be jacked up. Who cares? Who cares? So, so this is so. So what I'm saying to you, because we're using a lot of little lingo. So if you're not in medicine and you don't know HDL, LDL, you know triglycerides, essentially this. Don't, if you're adhering to the proper human diet, it really, I don't give a rip what your whole cholesterol is. I just don't because you're doing what your body needs to function optimally. We know there's studies that show specifically that all cause mortality is increased with low cholesterol. In other words, we know that the people that live the longest have the highest cholesterols. What's problematic is high triglyceride levels and low HDL levels. So Nicole just mentioned fatty livers. So fatty liver, we used to see this with alcoholics that overdo it with alcohol. But I'm seeing this on, I'm, I'm bad with numbers. I'm seeing this on a large majority of patients that come to the emergency department with abdominal pain that we do advanced imaging. So I'll get a CT scan and they have fatty liver, but that's from carbohydrate consumption. Okay. So again, increased carbohydrate consumption causes an increase in triglycerides, which results in disease, fatty liver, and so many other, other, uh, um, problems. So, um, again, in a nutshell, go back, watch the, my video on, uh, on cholesterol. Uh, but yes, your cholesterol, your bad cholesterol, your bad cholesterol. And then we have to like break that down, like whether it's big and fluffy or small and dense. I mean, again, I, I don't want to like take up too much time. Um, but there is, um, uh, it's more, the cholesterol issue is the problem with uh, carbohydrate consumption and triglycerides. So that's, that's where we're going with that. Yes, uh, cholesterol is definitely a controversial topic. Yeah. Um, say so. I am going to mention this doctor, and I know I know the people in the chat are are going to be uh, kind of confused why I mentioned this doctor. So Paul Saladino. Now, I personally do not have a problem with consuming honey and berries. Honestly, I don't uh, because we did eat those things. We, it's just. It is. I don't agree with the amount. I don't agree with the two, 300 grams of carbs. I think that's insane. But a lot of people discount his information because he eats fruit and honey now and all that. He can get away with it because he's very active. He surfs for four hours a day. He also right. goes to the gym. Like he's active like six, eight hours every single day. So he can get away with it. But that doesn't mean his information's bad. So he did a talk, a very in depth, almost two hour conversation with a cardiologist. And it was a friendly debate. 
And Paul Saladino was defending LDL, like meaning it's not the cause of heart disease. And the cardiologist was, of course, saying that it's a contributing factor and all this stuff. It was a very interesting conversation. I definitely recommend people go check that out as well. But he did mention um, insulin resistance as being kind of like the, so he mentioned LDL being the, the kind of like the wood for the fire. Um, it's associated, but it's not the spark. And he said that insulin resistance is the spark that, that lights the flame and LDL just kind of gets wrapped up. Yes. In that. It's because everything's sticky. Like that's how I like it. Like, you, we really need to like bring things down to a level that everyone can understand. Um, and yeah, I like that. Yeah. Cause it makes things sticky and then they stick to the um, uh, vessels, which causes, I mean, which causes narrowing, which causes disease, right? Stroke, MI. Um, no. Yeah. I, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. His information is not bad. Do I agree? Do I have a problem with honey and berries? No. Do I agree with eating as much as he is eating? No. But does that mean his information is bad? No. I just say that because people give him a bad, uh, people think badly about him. But that was a really good conversation. I watched the whole two hours and it was fascinating to me because I do get that question a lot. Every time I work with a client and I and I recommend increasing their their meat consumption, the first words out of their mouth is, what about coronary, uh, what about heart disease and uh, cholesterol, right? So I don't know if this is true and then we'll get off the cholesterol topic. So I know that they're lipoproteins and I need to get smarter on the topic of cholesterol because we were just taught the basics in my nutrition training and I'm not a doctor, so I don't prescribe things. So I, I never really did a deep dive on it, but I do know that uh, our bodies do make it to a very minimal extent. Our genetics play a factor in the levels of cholesterol. I know they're lipoprotein. They, the LDL transport things across across the cells, across the bloodstream, all that stuff. Um, so an analogy I heard recently is the lipid panel that people order for their um, cholesterol. And when it comes to the LDL portion, that panel, and I, and I don't know if this is true, that's why I'm asking. So that panel tests for the passengers in the car, not necessarily the cars on the road. I guess there's a separate test for that. But does that LDL panel test the, so like there's a traffic jam in New York City. I don't care how many people are in the cab in front of me. I care about how many cars are on the road because the amount of cars are on the road is really preventing me from getting the point A to point B, not the passengers. Is that true? Well, yeah, I mean, I, and again, I'm not a PCP, so I That's never true. order lipid yeah. panels. Um, but a traditional lipid panel looks specifically at the three components, the good cholesterol, which is HDL, triglycerides, and the LDL, so the, which is the bad cholesterol. Um, and you can fractionate that, you can break it down, but that's an additional test done by the PCP. Instead, they just look at the LDL, see a big number, they don't look at it. But again, we're not looking to see if it's small and dense or big and fluffy. Um, and again, if you're adhering to a carnivore diet, so if, you've, if you're consuming a ketovore or carnivore, so if you're consuming 20 grams of carbs uh, or less um, a day, then we know like just intuitively that your triglycerides are going to be low um, and your HDL is most likely going to be high. So again, we know that the LDL, you don't even really need to do the test, right? Like I had a professor in school that said, ordering lab tests is like picking your nose in public. If you find something, you need to know what to do with it, oh. right? I think we as humans, we just love tests. We yeah. want to test, test, test. I'm like, I again, look at yourself. How do you feel? Again, when you come into the emergency department and someone's worried about my blood pressure because it's 90 over 60, I feel great. Stop. Like, so in other words, don't just look at the numbers. You can't just look at the test score. What we're doing is, is we're just trying to give our bodies what they need to heal themselves. And we know that by adhering to an ancestral diet, an anti-inflammatory diet, like all is going to fall into place. Does it always fall into place overnight? No. But I will say like all of these people that I'm seeing right now that are on like, um, uh, medications to lower their glucose levels, secondary to diabetes. Um, the big one is, uh, uh, semaglutide. If you haven't seen my video on that, please watch that. Please watch that. There is risk associated with absolutely every single pharmaceutical. And that's what we need to be looking at. Not our numbers and treating this, but what are the risks associated with the medication that you're taking when people are like all worried about eating meat? and their cholesterol levels, yet they're taking a statin and don't know what that statin's doing and that the actual benefit is 1%, but the risk is, you know, 
giving you diabetes, causing brain fog, like causing rhabdomyolysis, which I see regularly in the department. I mean, that's the thing. Pros and cons. The Hippocratic Oath is do no harm, but sadly, modern medicine is doing so much harm right now, which is why it's really my goal to help every single person out there who's willing to listen with an open mind to become an advocate for themselves. Because if you don't advocate for yourself, you are going to get sick and you are never going to have the life that you want. Because if you continue to rely on pharmaceuticals, you're not going to get the answers that you want. And, and that's that's a message that needs to be shared widespread because you know what? All of your physicians, all your PAs, your nurse practitioners, whoever you see, our schooling is funded by big pharma. So that's how we're trained. I'm not lying. Like this is, a, I'm just being authentically me. Like, listen, like I, I'm not proud of it. Like, but at least I'm looking outside the box and I'm calling myself out because I advocated for a plant-based diet for so many years. I've never been a big pharma advocate, not ever, ever. But at least now, and it's difficult, right? Because people are like, are you losing followers? Or I don't care. Because listen, I'm human. I'm evolving. I'm learning. And the thing is, is I'm so appreciative of everyone in the carnivore community for the support, for the information that you're sending my way. I'm reading everything as quickly as I can and really trying to reach out. Like I've already reached out to a few dietitians that I know who are diabetic educators. I'm reaching out to other PAs that I'm friendly with physicians I'm leading by example in my department and I know that through you know when people see examples um and being like I'm leading by example I hope I'm, I'm not I'm not quite so bold as to like tell people like my colleagues what they need to do but at least they're looking at me and being like she looks healthy hmm. like oh she you know she's pretty cool like we'll look into what she has to say and you do it in a non-pushy open way um, and so I, I think that everyone needs to continue to have these open conversations with their provider. If your provider slams the door in your face, it's not the right provider. Um, because we in medicine, Nicole and I were talking about this beforehand too. I don't know everything. I just know where to find the answer. So if, if a patient asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I'm like, hey, let's figure this out together. I don't know. Let's look it up. You know, I, I, I'm not, your doctor is not perfect. They don't walk on water and they don't know everything. And a lot of them trained a lot of years ago and they're so inundated with stress and patient load at work that they're not doing what they should be doing and continuing their medical education. So just remember that a lot of times, you know, far more than your doctor about nutrition. I have a bachelor of science in nutrition and I'm specifically saying nothing from my bachelor of science has contributed to what I'm teaching today or what I know to be true. In other words, it's all, it's all a bunch of hogwash. Um, so there's that as well. So just know that you probably, if you've looked into anything with diet, carnivore or of the like, you know more than your doctor. A lot of doctors don't even know the difference between carbohydrates, protein, and fats. They just don't. They don't know about essential fatty acids. They don't know about nutrient deficiencies. They don't know about fat consumption. They don't know about carbohydrates. They definitely don't know about fasting insulin levels. They can't tell you, like they don't know about C peptides or whatever. They know A1Cs, they know regular glucose levels, they know if you're pre-diabetic according to your glucose level. They're still promoting, you know, they're still promoting that you adhere to a low salt diet. Are you kidding me? And they're like recommending the DASH diet to decrease your blood pressure. And you're scratching your head and you're saying, hmm, why am on, why am I on two going on three medications for my uh, blood pressure and it's still not budging? It's because it's your diet. That's the thing but they're not willing to have the conversation. Number one, it takes too long. Number two, they don't know anything about it. So guys, just keep, if I can like, if I can just like stress something, keep being an advocate for yourself. Your human body is your human body. Your gut, 80% of your serotonin is in your gut. Trust your intuition and your gut feeling. You know better than your doctor most of the time. I, I, I You really do. Yeah, uh, the, only, the only two things I will add is, um, outside of amen is, uh, is I apologized to a lot of my clients current and past because I was trained the same way when it comes to nutrition. Um, you know, my formal education and, you know, I was plant-based myself and their health wasn't improving and now I'm just going against my training. So it's just a lot of hours, a lot of money, a lot of testing and studying that I went through to get these credentials that I'm not even using hardly any of it. I'm using some of it. I mean, the biochemistry yeah, the basics like the, that. This, yeah. The basics. Yeah. Um, so no, I a hundred percent agree. Um, 
with, with everything you said. And then the last thing is you're your own advocate. My doctor back when I was still obese, I mean, I'm not to my goal yet. I'm almost there, but they want to put me on blood pressure meds. Um, because my diet was crap. Obviously I was almost hundred pounds overweight. I said, no, I said, let me try to lose weight. They never talked to me about life. Same, same with uh, sleep apnea. Cause I was fat. Uh, I was obese. I call a spade a spade. I had sleep apnea. So they sent me home with the machine. Not one doctor who are trying to prescribe me stuff and send me home with equipment, talk to me about lifestyle, diet, told me to lose weight, anything. They were just super quick to say, uh, here's a script for blood pressure meds. Here's your script for a CPAP machine. Here's how to order it. Like all that mm -hmm. stuff. I came home with the CPAP machine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I said, no, I took the sleep. I did take the CPAP machine because I wanted to save my marriage. Cause my husband was sleeping in the other room because I was roaring. I didn't know this little body could snore that loud. Um, but, uh, but when it comes to the blood pressure meds, I didn't take any pills. I said, no. So, um, just take, exactly what Amanda said. You're your own advocate. If your doctor tries to put you on something, you have every right to say no, uh, to fire your doctor, go to another doctor, um, whatever, whatever the case is, but you do not have to do what your doctor says if you don't agree with it. But and also remember they're good people with good intentions and good hearts. I think, I just, I think that they're just, they're not as well informed as they need to be sometimes. And again, that's the medical model, but that's why that's why education and being open is so important. Right. Um, so Rick, so Rick has been, of course, a uh, carnivore for over 40 years or 40 years. Uh, he said, can you, can anyone explain to me how sugar can make you crave it? It's so nasty. So this doesn't have to be a long conversation, but I was a sugar addict. I didn't get to almost a hundred pounds overweight without a problem with food. That it's just the way it is. No one gets to be obese or or have a weight issue without some sort of problem with food it's those foods are addictive and they're made to be addictive but it's all how your body responds to it on the physiological level kind of like what i what i described earlier your your hormones respond to emotions uh, naturally whether you're happy sad your body doesn't distinguish it responds the same way and a lot of people turn to food or for those emotions because your glycogen stores, your glucose, so sugars released into your bloodstream, like all these things are happen, happening on a physiological level to where some people, it affects your appetite. So your ghrelin, your hunger controlling hormones increase, your leptin, your, I like to call your fuel gauge decreases. Now, some people's appetite can get suppressed, but the most, the vast majority of people have increased appetite and increased cravings because of their physiological response. It's just the difference is if you're eating the right foods, like an animal-based diet, or depending on your emotional and mental health at that point, you may not be, you may not a have those cravings like other people do if you're on an animal-based diet. B, you are you have better coping mechanisms to where you don't rely on food. Unfortunately, people like me who had a traumatic childhood event. I relied on food. That's how I coped because I was 11 when my brother died. I didn't know how to grieve. Hi, kitty. I didn't know how to grieve. Um, so I turned to food. That's what I did. And I became mildly addicted to the sugar. But it, it's a coping mechanism. Your body does respond a certain way to put off those cravings. It's just the difference is if you're eating an animal-based carnivore or whatever diet, then your hormonal response isn't going to be as much as much as someone who is following a higher carb diet your hormones are going to respond differently um so that's the difference if you're coming from a standard american diet that's why most people are overweight or obese or have a sugar addiction or a carb addiction it's because of the way their hormones are responding and then b it's their it's the way they're coping based off their emotional and mental state so that's without getting too in the weeds but it it is, it is a true, it is a true addiction. People do have true addictions kind of like alcohol because it's a drug. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's good. And I think that, I mean, it's kind of like saying like, um, why are we addicted to cocaine? I mean, and some people are, and there's been studies, some people's amygdala and the brain lights up for cocaine and some it doesn't. I mean, I can reiterate what Nicole said, but also like vitamin deficiencies. So if you're deficient, if your body's deficient in something, um, then you're going to have like weird cravings as well. So adhering to a high fat protein um, carnivore diet, I think eliminates that. Um, 
Um, so Jonathan does this every every stream. So show us your guns. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I can't do them. <laughs> Jeez. I should take the take. I should take the whole sweatshirt off. But no, I'm not gonna. He hey, Jonathan, I'm gonna go check out some of my uh, thumbnails on my videos, and you can see all my muscles. I, I actually took a picture in the middle of my cooking. Uh, I like pulled my sleeves up and just flexed and sent him a picture. He's like, I said, as soon as I get rid of the excess fat, because I'm still losing fat, I was like, it'll be good. He's like, that's not bad, actually. I do have I do have a, a bump. I do yeah. have a pretty big bump. But yeah, I sent him a picture. <laughs> I love that. You know what's so great about carnivore is like, I can see my six pack now. I mean, all of the things like, and just a plug for women, like with uh, um, muscle health, um, I think the carnivore diet is supreme, right? But I think that everyone needs to be doing um, weight training because if you have more muscle, um, that's also going to help with glucose um, regulation. Um, it's going to help with posture. It's going to help with stability. It's going to help to decrease um, like or prevent osteopenia, progressing to osteoporosis. Um, if you have better stability, strength, balance, um, you're going to have less risk for fracture. And we know that like, you know, hip fractures and, and the like increase mortality as we age. So, and hormonal control. I mean, we could go on and on about muscle, but please get in the gym, lift heavy weights, not little pansy weights, lift heavy weights. And if you don't know how to do it properly, then hire a trainer for a month, figure out how to do it. Um, but again, it will increase bone density um, and helps all around with everything. It's more metabolic too, so it'll help with your oh, yeah basal metabolic rate, Jack. So yeah, yeah, exactly for sure. So Linda McAllister, what's going on? Thanks for joining us. Uh, tips for a first time fast. I think I think we kind of covered this, but mm -hmm. uh, Amanda, do you have any any tips that maybe we didn't talk about? I, I think I think Linda, we did. So in a in a real big nutshell, is you just eat when you're hungry. So this is completely different than what you've heard of in the past, but we're going to, we're kind of reverting back to our ancestral diet, right? Like, so animals aren't told how much they can eat and how much they can't eat, right? Like the, you know, the animals, like the cow grazes in the, in the, in the pasture till he's full, right? And so that's what we're doing. So you're going to eat a meal. You're going to eat a meal until you're comfortably full, like almost like stuffed, you know, um, for the first two weeks I adhered to carnivore, I kind of felt this like, un like, like a little bit of nausea almost. And I think it's because I wasn't used to eating so many uh, nutrients that were being absorbed at once. And uh, it was just kind of weird in my brain to be eating so much. So you do that and then you don't eat again until you're hungry. So in the beginning, you might be eating more often, but eventually you might be doing like OMAD or like you might be eating one meal a day or two meals a day. So don't worry about the fasting. I think that people are so worried about counting macros and counting calories and portions. And oh my gosh, I want to get lean and I want to lose the weight and I want to do it as fast as possible. We're not looking for a quick fix. We're looking for a lifestyle and we're looking for a way in which to change and to live our lives. So it's just naturally going to happen. Your appetite's going to regulate. And once your appetite regulates, then you'll figure out how often you need to eat. So I wouldn't worry about the fasting, I guess is what I'm saying. There's so many benefits associated with it, but it's going to just happen naturally as it's supposed to. Yeah, 100%. Um, before we get into more questions, I just want to give a shout out to Roger. He used to weigh over 400 pounds, lost 170 pounds, and he's now 230 pounds and continuing to lose more pounds every week. Heck yeah, Roger. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Congratulations. Goosebumps. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. So next question, crypto carnivore, is that cryptocurrency carnivore? That's interesting. Um, so been on lion diet for eight months, going great, except for some digestive issues. We'll only go number two every three days. Oh, uh, I can explain that too. Or, or so then have to stay close to the bathroom going multiple times for hours. Um, I believe it was crypto carnivore or someone else who actually asked this same or similar question. I apologize, Crypto Carnivore, if it, if it was you that asked this in a previous stream. But um, do you have a response to this, Amanda? Well, it's basically just because you're, I mean, anyone on a carnivore diet, whether it be lion, so if your lion diet is just eating red meat and salt and water, uh, I'm guessing that's what you're referring to. And so again, everything that you're eating is bioavailable. So you're using 90%, um, your body's utilizing 90% of what you're eating. So your waste, your poop is going to be so much less 
Um, when I was adhering to a fiber rich diet, right, I was pooping like four or five times a day. I had so much gas in my stomach. It was horrible. And so that's what I always tell patients when they start with the carnivore slash lion diet is that their waste is going to be, it's just, it's kind of in your head, right? You need to poop because that's what you're used to. That's what everyone tells you you need to do. Um, but there's nothing to poop. So you poop when your body needs to. And if you're eating fatty red meat, if you eat more fatty meat in a day and you're over consuming fat, your body like gets rid of it. So it comes out in loose, greasy uh, stool. Um, and so I think that that's probably why um, you're like peeing out of your bum or, or whatever. I mean, that's essentially like what happens is you just are over consuming the fat, but I wouldn't be worried about it at all. Yeah. Another thing I can add, that's exactly what I was going to say. The other thing I would add is I don't know how much water you're drinking. Um, but drinking water with your meat can help with the digestion process too. Um, help it digest a little easier. So maybe try, I don't know how much water you're drinking. I don't know what your diet looks like, but, um, if you don't think you're drinking enough water, maybe try that, um, as well to see if that, see if that helps. I mean, and it's like your whole microbiome is like just readjusting. I think I saw somewhere over here that it someone said about it takes years. It does. Like you're just, you, you, I don't know how old you are, but you've been living a certain way for, you know, however many years and your body just has to like reacclimate to. Right. All right. Bonnie, how's it going? Uh, does a carnivore diet help with arterial the oh, atrial fibrillation? Hey, Bonnie. Um, so interesting question. I, I haven't seen any research to suggest that it does. I mean, AFib is basically an electrical um, imbalance in the heart, right? Like it's uh, it's like kind of working overtime, causing the um, atria to fibrillate and causing like a, a fast, irregular rhythm. Um, it couldn't hurt because could that be caused by an increased amount of inflammation? It could. So I'm just pontificating here. Um, I think that, again, um, if you have a fib and you're probably on a rate control agent and you're also on a blood thinner, um, I think that uh, the cardboard diet could could be helpful. Um, I, I don't know. We could. Um, what is that cardiologist, Dr. Ovardi or o, begins with O? Like he might know. Have you heard of him? Um, Anyway, Dr. Ovedia. Ovedia, yeah. So he, we need to ask him that question because he's the cardiologist. He would know the answer to that. I, I can't think of anything um, specifically uh, relating the carnivore diet with AFib. Sadly. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a doctor, so obviously all these medical questions go to Amanda, but um, I don't pretend to be one. But I will say, I will say, the only thing I will say is, what do you have to lose? Just give exactly. it a shot. And, my, my and point exactly and see what happens. And the mm -hmm. other thing is, is the carnivore diet, you know, there are people who in the space who may be a little bit more dogmatic and extreme, like saying, yes, carnivore diet can help with X, Y, Z without really knowing. I, I don't like to go that route. I like to say the carnivore diet cannot cure or fix everything. It could help most things. So it may not be able to correct a hundred percent of every single ailment you have, but it certainly will help most things. Um, but I, I just, that's, I like to say that because I think there are a lot of people who just willy nilly say yes. Like whenever there's a question on the carnivore diet, can the carnivore diet help this? They just automatically say yes. And I don't ne necessarily agree with just automatically saying yes, because while it's important to eat your proper human diet, um, as Ken Berry coined, or, um, it can, eating that way will absolutely help. I don't think it's a fix all for every single thing that we have in our, in our health, it will help most things, but it won't fix everything. I think like if you are living in a house, you want a house with a very firm and stable foundation. Um, and so, and that's what carnivore diet's doing. It's giving your body the foundation to decrease inflammation, normalize sugar levels and reduce fasting insulin. So, and those are, and then, and there's so many disease processes that stem from an imbalance in those things. Yeah. Um, Annette, Hey, how's it going? Um, answer to AFib. Yes. Mom now 86 has AFib. She eats very meat based. Her blood work is so good. She managed with a minimum dose of meds and her cardio uh, said she only now needs to come once a year. Oh, that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, That's awesome. And she's probably not drinking alcohol, which can cause holiday heart and worse than AFib. And same thing with uh, uh, other stimulants like caffeine. So those are other things to think about. Okay, I definitely don't want to keep Amanda. Do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. 
I don't want to wear her out on her first live. Um, yeah, this is my first live, y'all. So thank you, Nicole. Thanks everyone for having me. I'm sweating over here. <laughs> like on the hot seat. Okay, so Lisa, how's it going? Uh, what about green tea? Uh, I gave up coffee for green tea. I have less anxiety and getting better sleep. Um, I, I never drank green tea. I think it, it looks and smells like a football field. So I'll, 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 I'll there are, there are things out there. In, like if you Google green tea health benefits, now I don't trust everything I read because I know it's very skewed, but there are things out there you can read on Dr. Google that say green tea can be used in a therapeutic manner. But what do you, what do you say about that? I mean, Lisa, I think it's like you listening to your body, right? Like some people are super sensitive to caffeine consumption and some aren't, you know? So, I mean, and there's advocates for the carnivore diet, like Dr. Chafee, who is totally anti um, uh, coffee or tea of any sort, where there's others that are more liberal. I definitely have a cup of coffee every day. Um, so if green tea is your thing, then do it up. I mean, it's an antioxidant. Um, it's a polyphenol. It's helped with um, a lot of people with weight reduction and stress control, according to some of the research I've read. So I'd go for it. Yeah. And, and Dr. Chafee says plants are trying to kill you as like a catchphrase to get people's attention while he, he may believe that himself. I, I'm not that, I'm not that extreme. I do have berries. I will have green beans every once in a while and avocado, even though that's technically a fruit or whatever. I, I think he says that to get people's attention more so. So uh, yeah, don't, don't fear the, you know, caffeine uh, if, in green tea and, and all those things, because people like Dr. Chafee are saying that just to get people's attention. In my opinion, he can very well mean that, but I think it's more of a catchphrase to, to get people to like, listen. Um, Lisa, I got interested in carnivore after hearing another YouTube creator say she had to stop carnivore because she was losing too much weight. I love, I'd love to have that problem. Your thoughts have me too. <laughs> what do you what do you say to that one? Right. So, so I think this is the thing, like we don't know exactly how much she was eating. Right. So if we completely change our diet and we're not, uh, we're not eating uh, carbohydrates, we're using a whole different fuel source. Um, and so if she is eating a teeny time, I mean, she probably was under eating. That's the thing. And we don't know how big she was. We don't know how much muscle mass this is. This is very difficult for me to answer because there's so many variables that could contribute to this. We don't know what her thyroid's doing. We don't know like her history, like our history and our, the way in which we've been eating for the last several years also plays a part in how quickly, how quickly we lose weight. Um, so I guess yeah. that, that sounds bogus, <laughs> like, Kind of bullshit but i mean i don't know like I, I don't know exactly why she stopped i think I, I would guess that she's not eating enough fat and she's not eating enough she's just not eating enough um but i don't know her history or her medical history or any of that so um let's like just do you probably and do the carnivore thing um you will lose weight it's inevitable you absolutely will lose weight you'll feel better um you know, you'll have a major diuresis in the first few weeks of carnivore just because you're not uh, consuming carbohydrates. And so you kind of uh, excrete all of the fluid that you didn't even know you had. Um, but then it's going to be your own story. It's going to be your own journey. It's going to depend on if you're weight training. It's going to depend on how active you are and like what your whole metabolic health looks like. What other ailments you have if you're trying to correct your sugars because you're diabetic. Again, so many variables, but I'm cheering for you and wishing you the best on the carnivore. Can't wait to hear how it goes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, without further information, uh, I would say the same thing. It, it's definitely uh, Seco. I wish that would just die. Uh, it's an incorrect currency of, of fuel. It sounds uh, like they just didn't want to do it anymore. You know what I mean? Sometimes like when people say stuff like that, like logically doesn't make much sense. So if something yeah. doesn't really make much sense, then they probably just didn't want, just didn't feel like doing it anymore. You know, it's a mass issue. It, you're, if they're losing weight too, too quickly, it's, it's a mass issue unless there's an underlying health thing going on. Yeah, we don't know if they have cancer. We don't know if they have thyroid. I mean like all the things. So, so they're yeah. just, they're just not eating enough, increase our fat. Uh, the easiest thing to do is triple B and E beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. That's it. And, and just do that. That's the easiest way to get all your protein and all your fat in, in just a, a limited amount of foods to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can build, build from there. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely not eating enough. So yeah, so just do you don't, don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Just listen to your body. And if you are losing weight too fast, I always like to recommend one to two pounds a week. If you're losing like 
four, five, six pounds a week, you definitely need to eat, increase your fat. You need to eat more. That's it's too fast weight loss to be sustainable and, and healthy. in in my opinion, um, uh, Karen, reducing fat actually did further damage to my knees, the cushion for my joints. The older I got, the more I dieted, the worse my joint pain got. My issue is find creative ways to eat carnivore. Ooh, interesting. What do you say to that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I don't, I haven't seen your x-rays, um, or your imaging of your knees, but as we age, right? Like we just have more inflammation in the joint. We can get joint space narrowing, you know, bone on bone. Um, and so I think probably as a woman though, if you're adhering to carnivore, like Nicole and I talked about earlier, you need to have more, uh, you need to have a higher fat to protein ratio anyways. And so now that you've done that, like you're decreasing the inflammation in the joint, um, helping with um, pain control. So um, the, the other, the second part of your question about the creative ways of eating, uh, that's interesting. I used to think that I cared about that and now I don't like, I love the simplicity of just going to the store. And if I'm in a hurry, just getting beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. It's so easy every single night. Like I just know what I'm doing. Like I just, cause if I can just put the food in my mouth and then the brain quiets and I'm not hungry, then I can go about my day. And like, I used to chop all the plants and do the sauces and the other thing. And that's the other thing. If you are putting any kind of rub on your meat, make sure that you're looking at the ingredient list. Because what I found when I started doing this is, oh my gosh, a lot of the rubs that I've used in the past second ingredient was uh, sugar. And some of the, uh, some of them contain a lot of seed oils, which we want to do, you know, nothing, nothing artificial. So getting rid of any kind of salt or rub, uh, uh, excuse me, any kind of uh, rub or marinade that has salt. I mean, excuse me, that has uh, sugar or seed oil in it. Yeah. Sometimes if I get like, um, if I get tired of eating the, the same thing, um, I'll just mix it up. I'll make a chili. I'll make, um, I'll maybe add some chicken one day mm -hmm. or a piece of fish or whatever one day. Um, and then going back to, um, yeah, yeah, it's so easy, like a lot of ground beef with, you know, uh, some cream and eggs and you bake it in the oven and whatever. And hot sauces, you can find a lot of hot sauces without uh, uh, additives that are easy. I'm in Maine, lobster. Hello, I just ate two, <laughs> right? Four pounds of steamers with Ooh. a stick of butter yesterday and then a steak last night. So yeah, don't forget about seafood. Exactly. If you're animal-based, um, just remember animal based, there's more meat, uh, there's more meat variety than just, uh, beef and steak. I stick primarily to that just cause for me, it's simple. I don't have to think about it. Um, cause I don't like, I hate cooking the, the simpler, the better for me, but there are times where I'll add ground Turkey or I'll add leaner pieces of meat just to, you know, give me a little bit of, of variety. So it's okay. If, if you do that every once in a while, um, we, we will definitely answer, uh, we have three more questions, so we'll answer those questions. I want to be respectful of um, Amanda's time, um, but I just want to give a shout out. What's going on, Master Chief, sir? And then we got uh, Susie says she lost too much weight on ketovore, but gained it back on carnivore combined with weight training. Increased the fat and protein, plus dropped the plant foods. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. Um, same with Kim. Hey, hey, Kim. Um, I have actually gained a few pounds lately on carnivore. I don't know why, but perhaps too much cheese or heavy cream or just maybe artificially decreased weight um, from a from a fast that's now equalizing. Who knows? Yeah. So Kim, myself and a couple of other people are giving up dairy. Now by dairy, I mean cheese. I cook in butter. I cannot give up cooking in butter. So I'm personally going to cook in butter. I don't eat sticks of butter, but I'm giving up dairy, cream cheese, all cheese. I need my cooking butter though. But for the month of September, um, because it's the same thing, like, um, just to see how my body responds. But if you've gained it back, I don't know what your diet looks like. It, it could be, it could be the dairy. Um, I know I bloat and get puffy with dairy. I, 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 I just get puffy and bloat, which can affect the number on the scale. So maybe try giving up the, the dairy. Um, also, it could be a mass issue. Um, like we said before, like on your portions, maybe you're eating too much fat, um, maybe decrease. Also, yeah. And also just like as a side note, like I don't ever get on the scale anymore because I know yeah. what I weigh. Um, so make sure that you're doing um, measurements 
And if your gym has the ability to test body fat, that's more important because if you're gaining lean muscle mass, you're going to increase body weight, but who cares? Like all we care about is increasing lean muscle mass and decreasing fat. So just like, it's, it's a, it's a knee jerk to hop on the scale. Uh, But once you get to a certain weight, that's really not necessary either. So just doing the measurements around your arms, your legs, your waist and your chest, you know, and clothes, because I always tell people yeah, clothes. Say, How do your clothes fit? Right. I, I I always tell people to throw the scale in the trash. Like whenever I have a client who asks me how I feel about the scale, I say throw it out yeah. <laughs> because, because it's all hormonal. It's not necessarily measuring. It's measuring weight. It's not body fat. Yeah. Right. Uh, like right. You said it's if you if you're stre- if it's hormones, it's the water fluctuations in your body because of your hormonal response. So if you if you had too much salt, you're going to be bloated. You're going to retain water. If you if you slept like crap, if you're stressed, like all that's going to affect your hormones, which is going to make the number on the scale go up. So I, I use the way my clothes fit to track my weight progress, my um, weight fat loss progress. I just use my clothes um, and, and how they fit. I never I didn't use a scale. Um, but yeah, that I, I hate the scale. <laughs> Same. Uh, Roger, can a carnivore diet help reverse osteoarthritis? I know it helps with my pain yeah. and inflammation. Yes, that's what ostero- osteoarthritis is. But do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, helps. Yeah, you're reducing inflammation in your body, which leads to disease, including osteoarthritis and pain. So proud of you. I'm proud yeah. of actually everyone that's stepped outside the box and taken it upon themselves to um, try the carnivore diet because I know it's going against the grain. So I also just wanted to give a shout out to everyone. Um, proud of everyone, honestly. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so master chief dropped heavy cream from coffee, lost seven pounds in the last four weeks. Congratulations. Yeah. It's very, it's very, uh, inflammatory and causes people issues like me. Like I said, especially around my jawline, I notice it more now where my face will get puffy. Um, if I eat too much cheese, uh, and Susie said too much dairy makes my skin break out. Yeah. That's the easiest thing to recommend is if you're eating dairy, just drop the dairy and see how you respond. Um, the last question, if anyone has any last minute questions or any, as I like to say in the mil- from the military, if you have any alibis, drop them, drop them in the question we'll, uh, in the chat and we'll hit on it. But uh, for now, this looks like the last question. So from Brooke, for me being type one diabetic, Hashimoto's is a huge obstacle to weight loss. Any ideas how to possibly begin weight loss with complex issues. Hmm. Yeah. um, I would, I mean, I'm guessing you have an insulin pump. Um, I would really dramatic. I would, it's the carbohydrate consumption. I would start there. Um, And then obviously like, I'm sure that you know how to manage um, and bolus with your, with your insulin. Like uh, again, without more information, Brooke, I really can't give additional information, but I think the carnivore diet, I'm seeing so many like, um, more obviously type two, um, but type one, you can uh, definitely change things as well, or how much you're having to bolus with insulin, because you want to give yourself as little insulin as possible really over the long haul. Um, So I think, you know, I'm hoping you're familiar with the carnivore diet. And if you're not, then um, becoming more familiar with it. Um, But I think that's really your answer. Yeah, Dr. Kilt actually um, hit on this during his live today. Um, He said, uh, Type two is a um, liver issue. Type one is a pancreas issue um, because that's where we get our um, insulin response from. But um, when it comes to type one, there's a lot whenever, and I'm not 100% smart on on type one because most of my clients are pre or type two um, because that's very, that's largely lifestyle. And I know type one is- It's autoimmune um, issue. Your cells aren't working. I mean, it's definitely that, but there's a huge inflammatory component too. So. Correct. And it's largely, uh, you know, your pancreas, it's just the insulin response is, is lagging. Right. So um, when it comes to type one though, there's this big misconception because whenever people talk about the carnivore diet or just lifestyle, just changing your diet in general, it's always pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes mentioned. No one talks about type 1 diabetes um, because I, I don't know if people think like it's a it's a lost cause. But I think if it, it would, the same would hold true. Now, I'm not saying you can reverse type 1 because it's a different issue that you're dealing with. Um, but if you are consuming uh, a heavily, you know, fat animal-based diet and eliminate the, the carbs and, and all that stuff that should hopefully at least help manage your blood sugar better still. Um, 
And maybe you can inject yourself with insulin less over the long term. So while you may not be able to reduce it, you should be able to manage it better and more efficiently and effectively. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. Well, I don't see any questions. Let's, uh, Lisa says, thank you. You are so welcome. Uh, you are so welcome, Jean Dixon. I hope this was uh, valuable. Uh, and I appreciate Amanda's time and and having her here with us on her first live. For me, it was very valuable to have someone so knowledgeable and educated in the healthcare space and and going against the, the grain and, and doing deep dive research. So I definitely appreciate you being here and, and the knowledge you provided um, to, to me and, and the chat. Thank you. I like, I love being here. Thank you so much. This was a very great experience and I'm appreciative for you allowing me to be here. Awesome. Well, please be sure to give Amanda's channel a sub. I know some people were kind enough to already do that. Her link to her channel uh, is in the description box uh, beneath this. I also put it in the chat. So please do show her some love. Check out her videos. Um, give her video some likes if you aren't subscribed to me. I appreciate a sub as well. I'm at former fat girl. But thank you all for spending your Sunday with us. We definitely, definitely appreciate you. Um, we couldn't have made this stream any more fun without you guys here. So we definitely appreciate you and your questions. Um, so other than that... We will say have a great rest of your afternoon. Have a happy and healthy day. And we will see you in the next one. See you later, everyone. Bye. <laughs>